All right, welcome back to the last section for our intro to data analytics, part one. <laughs> so this is part three of part one. And we're gonna finish out this lecture by thinking about some other issues with measurement. So we've been talking about types of variables and how we might define our statistics for our hypothesis testing. But then we run into this problem of measurement error. Right, so we finished off with like, there is naturally some sort of error in our measurements, nothing is perfect. The other things that we have to consider is um, the validity and reliability of our measurements. So validity is a kind of a tricky concept of this idea of it's the measurement tool measures what it's supposed to measure. Okay. So I don't use height to measure IQ, that's not valid. You know, when you have these predefined terms like positive psychological outcomes, then you could easily get in arguments over whether or not the number that you come up with accurately represents what we're trying to measure. So there are a lot of statistical ways to kind of support this, but this is something that takes a lot of work to support that this is the best way to measure something. And we can do this through content validity. Okay, so um, the, the questions on the scale look right, because that's sometimes called face validity, but the content matches the construct we're trying to measure. So for positive um, post-traumatic growth, we could talk about becoming a better person after something bad happens to you. Okay. And then also ecological validity. And there's even more than this, but here's just some examples that this study or this experiment can be applied in some real world scenario. And so in our study, this is true, right? We have natural disasters and they can be applied, <laughs> right? This uh, work that we're doing can be applied in the real world. Now the other half is reliability. Reliability is easier to test. So it's the measure will produce the same results under the same conditions, okay? Now, if we're trying to change people's outcomes, we expect their scores to change. But reliability is in the same scenario with the same conditions, we should get the same score. So if you take a test multiple times, you should get the same scores in the same conditions. Okay. Sometimes it's called test retest reliability. So if a test you want to test you again, you should get approximately the same score if nothing has happened in the middle. Okay. And then there are other types of split half reliability, some other ones that can kind of support this idea that we, we have a test that produces the same answers over and over again. So when the answer changes, that's because of something we did and not because the test is unreliable. So circling back to our research hypothesis stuff, now we've defined our variables and thought about some of the issues with those variables, let's collect the data. Now, I really want to make sure that the distinction between the measurement level, nominal or null interval ratio, is very different from the um, data collection procedure. Okay, so how do I measure? Okay. So we might have a study that's correlational, we might have a study that's cross-sectional, or full experiment, or a mix and match of these. Okay, so one study might actually be multiple types of things. Okay. So let's talk first about correlational research, and this is where you just naturally observe what's happening in the world, and you don't directly interfere with it. So any survey that you have ever taken where you clicked a bunch of boxes is a correlational study. Sometimes survey research is both, but generally often is a correlational study. But careful not to mix correlational research where we're naturalistically sort of observing or asking people questions, having them fill out these surveys with correlation as a statistic because it's easy to think that correlational research can only be certain types of statistics, and that's not true. <laughs> okay. Correlational research just implies that you aren't manipulating or changing anything, you're just gathering the data. Now, cross-sectional research versus longitudinal research is that we take a cross-section of the data so if I'm trying to examine something about age or time differences, I ask a bunch of different people all at the same time these questions. Okay, so it's a cross section. A longitudinal design is the opposite of this, where you ask the same person these questions over time. Okay. So we can see these age changes because we've measured them multiple times versus taking everybody at once. Okay. So sometimes cross-sectional studies uh, suffer from what's called a cohort effect. 
So these are the different life experiences of the people at different ages can affect your study. So if you're studying the use of um, social media, for example, and you're testing people in their 80s, they have different life experiences than folks who are in their 20s. Now, experimental research, and now a cross-sectional study could also be experimental. Okay. Um, so, you know, trying to keep these things separate, but it's not experimental on age because it's naturally observing age, okay? Because I can't make someone older. Okay. Or experimental study is where you have a variable that is systematically manipulated. Okay. And by that, it means you have control and you've manipulated it. So in our study, where we've given some of people the texting therapy and some people not, that is under my control and I've manipulated it. But let's say I'm interested also in um, gender. Does this work better for people who describe themselves as women versus men? Okay, that would be cross-sectional, <laughs> right? Uh, if I do age, but it's also correlational because I can't manipulate that variable. So studies don't often fall into like one of these things, right? I could implement different surveys for different people, that would be experimental, but then ask them and measure variables that are correlational. But the beauty of experimental variables is that I can now make a statement about cause and effect. Now here's some rules for cause and effect, right? So these come from Hume. The cause and effect have to occur close together in time. This is the contiguity principle. Okay, so if I give them the texting thing and then they get better. Okay, I can't give them the texting thing and then eight years later they get better. Okay. The cause must occur first before the effect. This just makes sense. Okay. And the effect should not occur without the cause. Okay, so they shouldn't just get better without this texting. So if people in my control group suddenly magically get better, that implies that maybe the texting wasn't the reason. Okay, maybe it's just time. The other piece to consider some called sometimes called tertium quid, which is a really fancy phrase for the third variable problem. Okay. And this could be any, it could be eighth variable problem, but this is called a confounding variable where something that we may or may not have measured affects the outcome. Okay. So in my study, a confounding variable might be income. So I might be interested in measuring that because people who have more disposable income tend to have better outcomes for obvious reasons and a natural disaster because they can escape and go stay somewhere else. People who don't, don't have these options. Now that's a variable I should consider and try to measure in the study so I can control for it. Um, but there are sometimes things that you don't think of because you don't know what you don't know. And so an example, a silly example might be uh, the relationship between ice cream sales and accidental drowning is actually confounded by weather because both of these things go up in the summer. Okay. There's a whole website um, that has these sort of what they're called voodoo correlations, things that are really correlated that you wouldn't expect um, because it's probably some third thing that you aren't thinking of. Okay. Now, generally the rule is to try to rule these things out. Okay, and so um, with these confounds, what we can do is say that the effect is present when the cause is present and that the cause is absent when the effect is absent. And so we try to design studies where the effect is present and the, I'm sorry, the cause is present and not present and hope that the effect follows these <laughs> rules okay, and goes along with us. And so the way you do that is you have a control condition, if you can. Some of these don't make any sense to have control conditions, but in our case, we can, we just don't give those people therapy. Or um, if you find that unethical, some versions of these studies allow people to flip. So you give one group the therapy and one group you put them uh, like on a waiting list. And so you have a period of time where they don't have the therapy and then you get them the therapy. So you can use them as a control group, but also still ethically help people out. And so those are just different types of studies, but within those studies, we can kind of collect data in sort of two distinct ways. Okay. So we can call these between group studies, so sort of between subject studies or independent designs. And I'm sorry in advance, but some of these have multiple names. And so it depends on um, what uh, kind of background you have or we can have what are called repeated measures within subjects or dependent designs. 
between group study has different people in these experimental conditions or any kind of categorical variable where there's different folks in different groups. So a gender variable is between subjects because you tend to associate with one or the other. And then we also might have, or especially in a longitudinal design or repeated measures where people see all of the different experimental conditions or the different groups that we're interested in measuring. And so my example, at first it starts as between subjects, right? I have one group that gets the therapy and one group that doesn't. But then in the group that doesn't, because I'm, I want to be ethically bound, I give them the therapy later. So that's also repeated measures. You can mix and match these in the same study. But keep that separate in your mind from the levels of measurement. So I've often found that students kind of confuse these different components. So we have the ways that we measure the variables, some traditional experimental designs, and then ways that we collect the data. So we can either force these to be different types of people or the same people over and over again. Unfortunately, on all of these, you can play around with them. It's like, you know, choose your own lotto game uh, where we can have different, all kinds of different ones combined together in complex studies. Now, the good thing about repeated measures design is it's more economical. So you get more bang for your buck because you get more data from testing people multiple times. Um, and then one problem is that you might have what's called a practice effect. So I gave you a test over and over again, you should hopefully get better just because you've taken it over and over again. And then the biggest one of all for repeated measures designs is fatigue. So you're testing people and giving them a very long test, they might get tired and then quit. <laughs> so you have to be careful there. Now within all of this, what we're gonna do in statistics, I'm gonna boil all of statistics down to one thing, it's gonna be magic. Systematic variation, which is differences in the outcome created by the independent variable or the predictor variable. So there are some sort of differences in the dependent variable from the independent variable and that's systematic. I can measure that and I know what in theory predicts that versus unsystematic variation which is differences in the outcome due to who knows what. Okay, this is often called error. All of statistics, all of it, boils down to systematic variation divided by unsystematic variation. And so all, all of them in some form revert to some sort of mathematical equation that says, here's the variance that we understand divided by the variance we don't understand or the total kind of depends on the statistic, but it's this idea of a ratio between what we understand to what we don't understand. Okay. And that logic is that the more we understand to don't understand, the larger the statistic, the more comfortable I am saying I understand this. If they're perfectly equal, the ratio is one to one, that means I have no idea what's going on because the variances are equal. So I, I know about as much as I don't know, which is not good. Okay. And so when we get into like looking at some of these formulas, we'll talk more about this idea of it's all of them revert down to this kind of ratio of what I'm gonna call good variance that I can explain to bad variance, stuff I can't explain or error. And it doesn't matter how they're measured. Okay, so this is kind of separate from measurement. Now measurement error goes into the unsystematic variance because we don't know why it's happening but it doesn't matter if it's between subjects, repeated measures, nominal, ordinal, categorical, ratio, interval. It's the idea that the statistics themselves kind of create these ratios that allow us to determine if we know more than we don't know. Now, one thing we could do to help us with this problem, this naturalistic issue of unsystematic variation, there's always some error, I don't know everything, right? Is that we could randomize. So we could randomly select participants or randomly assign them. And what that doesn't get rid of the error, it equalizes it. So it doesn't like eliminate error. Some people talk about how randomization eliminates error. That's incorrect. Randomization equally spreads the love <laughs> to each side. So with this randomization, it, it it doesn't reduce bias in a sense, but it, it reduces the the level of noise due to you know, factors outside your control, puts them evenly in each group. 
Okay, so I'd want to randomly assign people to my different treatment and not treatment groups to kind of control for the fact that some people are just weird. I hope you get the equal amount of weird in each group. Now, when I get into analyzing data, this final step in our process, okay, always going to work on making a, some sort of visualization. If a visualization is possible, you should do it because those are much easier. Um, well, they're easy to manipulate too, but they're much easier to understand than if I tell you the T is 8.5, right? Like, what does that mean? Okay, that's a ratio of good variance to bad variance. <laughs> so, um, but what does that mean? If I show you a pretty graph where the texting group has a much higher score than the not texting group, that makes a lot more sense. And then we're gonna fit the data to some type of model. Okay. Now that sounds scary, but um, what we're really gonna do is like come up with some way to determine if our hypothesis is supported and we'll build models. Now models could be as simple as the mean, two different means and one means bigger than the other, or they can be more complex and we can use multiple regression. And so one final component to this like sort of crazy research jigsaw is this distinction in the types of data we've collected. Okay. So we have to really understand who's the population that we're interested in and what kind of sample do we have? And does that sample adequately represent the population? Because if not, well, who knows what the results mean? Okay. So if you think about elections, okay, if you only sample from let's say here, I'm here in Pennsylvania, uh, and this election, it went blue. Okay. But if I only sampled from the middle of the state, <laughs> you would not know that because this is predominantly a red area. Okay. Blue areas on the outsides of the state, where the big cities are. Okay. So we have to have a sample that adequately represents who, what we're trying to study. Okay. It doesn't have to be a who, it can be a what. Okay. So the population is all elements from a set of data, okay, all all of the possible people, data points, whatever, that we're trying to understand. So my example with natural disasters, this is every person who's ever experienced a natural disaster. That is clearly not possible for us to collect data on all of those people or ethical. I can't force them to be in my study. So we have to sample from that. Now, if you're working with business data, this might be your sales records for all of your history. Now you might have all that data. There are times when we could get all the data, but especially when working with participants, not possible. So let's sample. Okay. And samples where we have one or more observations taken from the data, from the potential population. So we find a natural disaster in the area, we go in, we ask people if they want to be part of our study because we have to give them, you know, the ability to say no. And then we collect a sample of people. And we hope that that is representative of the larger group of people who we could have possibly sampled. And so from that sample, we might fit a simple statistical model. Okay. And that model is supposed to represent what's happening in the real world. And I think a lot of people who do statistics don't think about them as models, but essentially that's what they are. Okay. And so the mean is a hypothetical value. I have the mean positive psychological outcomes for each of my groups. And that mean score may not actually be a score that's in the data but it's a model of the data. Okay, so when you say the average positive outcome is 17.5, okay, on the scale, and the average for our not texting group is, is 10. Okay. The 17.5 may not be a score someone can literally score, but it's a number used to represent that sample of people. So it's a model in the sense that it is a prediction of the, 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 date, the possible scores for that group. So the average is a good use for, for nice, pretty data, like the data pictures behind me. The average can, can be very close to a lot of people's score. So it's, it's a popular model for um, measurement. And so we'll talk a lot more about how we create these models in the next couple of sections, okay, about how to think about this in a kind of a different way than just thinking about the statistical test. And so let, let's think here. Let's look at the IRIS data set. And let's look at the whole data set and pretend that this is the entirety of flowers that exist. Okay. And so here are their sepal links. Okay, now sepal links here are ratio scale data. 
And these scores here, 5.006, may not be a literal score that any flower has, but it is a model of the best representation, is the best picture that we can say to kind of summarize this data. Okay, so if we say on average, there are five. Okay. And we are used to dealing with averages all the time. Okay. So the average drive length to work, although most of us are working from home right now, but so the average drive length is none, huh? Time is a ratio scale. Um, but we can think about the fact that, you know, average commute time is 20 minutes, for example. Okay. It may, you may never actually take 20 minutes. Some days you may take 22 minutes, some days you may take 19 minutes, but 20 is a good representation, a good model of how long it takes to get. Now let's show how samples do not necessarily map on to the population. Okay. And so Populations are often, the, the numbers you create are called parameters. If you say this is a parameter, that means that you are estimating the entire population versus a sample's statistics. And it's cutely, you know, population parameters, sample statistics to help you keep this straight. And so a parameter is assumed that you have an entire data set to represent the population. Okay. But the numbers from a single test or experiments are considered a sample. And so if you see a Greek symbol like mu or eta, sigma, kind of the big ones we're gonna use, you're implying that that's the population score, that's the parameter. If you see our sort of normal Latin letters, you're implying that that is from a specific sample. Okay. And we're gonna make this distinction clearer later. In general, we're gonna work with samples, but we're gonna use those samples to represent the population. So we're gonna estimate that population parameter through our sample. Okay. And even better if we have multiple samples so that we can kind of create um, a better estimate. Okay. Now let's pretend. So I sampled 15 um, rows randomly from the entirety of the flowers. And my sample here fairly closely matches the population, all of the flowers. Okay, so this is all of the flowers and this is my fake sample. And if we did this procedure over and over again, what we would see is in general, we should get something close to the average because that's the way averages work. But it's this idea that um, our samples can be a good representation of the actual population parameter as long as the sample is representative, meaning that it is the same types of data characteristics, the same types of people, the same types of data. Okay. And so they should pretty closely match, okay? Especially if you measure them over time, mini samples. Mini, mini samples even. So M-A-N-Y-M-I-N-I. -I. I think I spelled that right. Many, many, many subject samples. <laughs> Anyways, lots of samples over time should represent the population. Now, lots of statistical models. So what we'll so preview for next time, we'll talk about frequency distributions. So thinking about the shape of the data, we can think about central tendencies, which is the measure of distance, the variability available in the data. Okay. Um, sorry, that's dispersion, the variability in the data. Central tendency, meaning um, median mode uh, value. So what's the, the middle of the data? Okay. Uh, dispersion here, meaning the variance or the spread in the data. And then we can even get bigger and better with things like z-scores, associations, um, and then get into the statistical tests themselves. So there are lots of models that we can create that aren't complex at all. So let's wrap this up. In this lecture, what have we covered? Well, we talked about that, our sort of introduction to data analytics. We talked about descriptive, prescriptive, and predictive analytics. Okay. Uh, a whole lot on theories and hypotheses and how we convert that into the actual variables and the data that we're going to measure. Okay. And so from here on out, we won't focus a whole lot on research design except where it's important. But I think it's good to start there because then when we start getting into the actual statistics, it's like this is the design that matches this statistic. Okay. You can't separate the two. Uh, we talked about the types of variables that are available between subjects repeated measures, but then our measurement, remember, is like nominal, ordinal, that kind of thing. And then the types of research design themselves. 
So um, we could do an experimental or a um, cross-sectional study or mix and match. And so then we ended with issues and considerations. So we talked about populations and samples, and we're going to take that and really expand more on it in the next lecture. So see you next week. We'll talk about more of, of these issues and how this actually applies to some of the numbers that we're going to create in our um, analyses this semester.